Good morning. It's good to have everybody with us. I'm Pastor Victoria, and I'd like to welcome you to our service and also welcome those who are online with us. Hi. Um, we're glad that you're able to be able to worship with us. We're going to begin our time of worship with our opening hymns, To God Be the Glory and My Faith Looks Up to Thee. You can follow the words in the hymnal or they are up on the screen. You may stand or sit as you feel comfortable to worship and let's sing together.
Please be seated. Welcome everyone. Welcome especially to those watching from online. We're glad to have you all here this morning. There are several announcements, but I'll start with the cards in front of you. Uh, there are prayer cards. They're kind of tanned in color. If you have a prayer or praise report, please fill those out in print and Pastor Victoria will share them during the prayer time. Also in front of you are visitor cards. Uh, I think I got the colors mixed up, but you understand. Uh, there are visitors card. If you're a new visitor, uh, a visitor kept coming back after a while, please fill those cards out. We promise we won't nag you. We just like to have a record of who you are. And there are gift bags uh, for you on the way out. Also the little fish in front. If you have done something in God's name for someone else, please put those in the offering plate. Uh, there are several announcements that I'm going to emphasize. Please make sure you read your bulletin. Uh, there are C CPA, excuse me, CPR class uh, is offered on November 16th at 7 p.m. The cost is $10. Uh, if you're interested in that, please sign up in the Narthex. Uh, there's a little Christmas tree in the Narthex. It has little tags on it. If you can help buy a gift for someone special, uh, it would help a little child who get, get a gift for Christmas. Time to sign up for poinsettias. Uh, they're $10. There's, there's a place in the bulletin for you to do that. Uh, perhaps you could buy one for somebody else and put it on there and take it to them at Christmas and make a nice gift. Super Supper, Hanging of the Greens. Please sign up for that. That's a special night where we have dinner and then we come in and have a special time of putting up our Christmas decorations. It's hard to, to realize that Christmas is just around the corner. Uh, let's please make sure you read your bulletin. There are more announcements in there. They're all important. If you haven't picked up a bulletin, please do on the way, on the way out. Let's pray. Holy God, nothing, nothing is, impossible is impossible with you. You called Elizabeth and blessed her with a miracle. You moved her mountain and gave us John the Baptist. You called Mary to be the mother of our Savior. You moved our heart to believe the impossible. Move us today to seek your will and desires. Give us thirst to seek you every day in prayer. Make us go deeper in your word, your love, and your mercy. And always remind us that nothing is impossible with you. Amen. Okay, at this time, if you'd like to stand and greet your neighbor, please do so. Start in the chorus. That's all I know. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah, just start. Praise the Lord. His mercy. 
mercy is more stronger than darkness is new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what love could remember no wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise Good morning. I'm here this morning as chairman of the Finance Committee. As we approach the Thanksgiving season, I want to share with you our gratitude for your generosity over the past few years. We've gone through a season that has obviously been challenging in many ways, and it's easy to get caught up in the malaise and the frustration to bless Carlson Memorial. He has used your generous gifts to further his purpose among ourselves, in our community, and literally throughout the world. Carlson's mission is to create a community of disciples of Jesus Christ, where people are welcomed, accepted, and loved, where no one stands alone. We take seriously Jesus' command to live lives of service as modeled in the Gospels. When I was young, a Sunday school teacher challenged us to consider that we might be the very best Christian somebody knows. We want every act of ministry in this church to bear witness to each other, to our community, and to the world of the transforming power of Christ. Despite the challenges of recent times, we're fulfilling that mission. Through your generosity, we have kept the doors open, the lights on, the AC functioning, 
and the staff paid. Through your generosity, our children and youth programs have provided Sunday school, children's church, Sunday and Wednesday programs, as well as VBS and the recent fall festival, to just give some examples. Through your generosity, we provided gifts to children through the Guardian Ad Litem program. We provided support to the Immokalee Pregnancy Center and the ACT Shelter. We provided gifts and personal items for St. Matthew's House. We're providing food to families throughout our community through Operation Backpack. We provided meals, prayer quilts for sick, homebound, isolated, and bereaved members of our church family. We've provided online services for those who cannot attend in person. The COVID threat has spurred us to expand our online presence, as well as our skill in virtual meetings, and has allowed us to broaden our concept of a community of worship to include those who cannot be physically present. It's also helped to bring together our traditional and contemporary congregations. Through your generosity, we have continued to provide financial support for the Kroll's ministry to international students in Wisconsin. If you're distressed about how tough things are here, let's chat for a minute about, uh, with, with Phil Keyes, things we'd like to add. One of the factors that shapes those choices is money. As we've been reporting in the bulletin, Carlson has been facing financial challenges, just as I know many of you have. Costs are up, income is down, and we've had to depend on reserves and stimulus money to pay the bills. Many of the examples of generosity I've been describing are supported by money you've given for a specific purpose, such as the Children's Home or the Good Samaritan Fund. Those funds go directly where they are designated. Uh, curiously, though, no one designates money to pay the electric bill. And despite your generosity, we're operating at a loss, not just against what we budgeted, but against bills we've actually had to pay. The deficit is not huge, but it does give us concern as we begin to plan for next year's budget. Many of our costs are already set. Salaries, benefits, apportionments, operating costs like utilities, maintenance, insurance, all those things are beyond our control. Your leaders, in all areas have worked hard to be good stewards and they are to be commended for the work they have done in being frugal with the funds you provided for them. Our spending has been significantly under budget, but just as the challenges in the world today have affected us individually, so they've affected Carlson. Even with the vacant staff positions, even though we've been, holding, been withholding payment of our apportionments, we're still falling short of paying the bills. Historically, we have finished the year with a strong surge in giving, and we're praying that a similar surge this year will allow us to finish in the black. Looking toward 2022, we need additional income in order to fill our staff vacancies, maintain our facilities, and continue our mission support. We respectfully request that you seek God's guidance in granting the church a cost of living adjustment. We understand some of you will be able to give more, others may not. I tell you with absolute sincerity that whatever you give will be received with thanksgiving and will be put And just as a reminder, you can give in person, in cash, check, use the on-site website uh, giving, or set up regular bill pay through your bank. Thank you. To believe that mountains can be moved and people can be saved and love can be shared. Bless these gifts so that we may continue building your kingdom until you come again in victory. In Jesus' name, amen.
let's stand and sing together our doxology. It's number 95 in your hymnal. <coughs> affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and I'd like to invite our children to come forward. Hello, how's everybody? Uh, who said great? It didn't sound great. <laughs> Somebody was like, great. Great, he was told to. All right, so good morning, everybody. Tomorrow's supposed to be pretty cool, so get ready for that. I think it's going to be in the upper 40s, so enjoy it, because we might not get many of those. <laughs> People have all of a sudden changed their plans. We're like, we're not going outside tomorrow. So guess what we're going to talk about? A conversation I had with another adult. How exciting. So... A few days ago, Mr. Bo and I, he was playing the guitar up here. We met for breakfast, and like two guys meeting together, the conversation naturally went towards siege weapons and warfare. And we were talking about catapults. You guys know what catapults are? We were talking about catapults and trebuchets. You know what that is? It's like a really fancy word for a catapult. And we were talking about ballistas, and we talked about huachas, which are like rocket launchers back in the old days with arrows and all this. And we were talking about siege warfare. And what these siege weapons did is they really broke somebody's morale. Do you know what morale is? It's kind of, what was that? Leadership. Yeah, like leadership, like confidence, like courage. So these people would have these castles, and sometimes these castles were already built for hundreds of years, and they thought they were safe in there. Aha, no weapon. A little arrow is not going to do much to this castle that's seen many battles and many victories. We're safe here. And then all of a sudden through the woods, the trees would shake and the birds would fly out and they would wheel out this huge catapult or this trebuchet, and the people in the castle would be like, what is that? And then all of a sudden, they would load this huge rock or boulder or tree stump in it, and they would launch it and would go through the air, and the people in this castle would brace for the impact, and it would shake, and there'd be dust and debris everywhere. And whenever they opened their eyes, they would see a corner of this castle, or maybe even a wall of this castle that had stood for hundreds of years, if not longer, was all of a sudden no more. Uh-oh, their castle was broken. Their morale would go down. And their confidence was shaken. We might not be as safe as we thought. Now, one of these weapons that they used was a flaming arrow. You guys know what a flaming arrow is? A really long time, it would extinguish. So, I don't know. Flaming arrows weren't that uh, effective. But what do you think they were used for? Do you think that they would use... Breaking wooden forts. Okay, so breaking wooden forts. What do you guys think wooden arrows were normally used for? Hmm. Yeah, setting fires is exactly it. So flaming arrows were another type of siege weapon. They weren't like directly aiming it at people a lot. They were aiming it at like the storehouses. They were aiming it into the castles, into the cities. They were just hoping a few would land on some, some straw roof buildings or in the storehouses where the grain was or where the munitions were. And just one little fire could spread through the whole city. And it would break 
their morale. So these flaming arrows are interesting because as an individual person, you didn't necessarily need to worry about them on the battlefield, but they were distracting because you were worried if they were going to hit your house or hit the church or hit the buildings or hit the storehouses, what were you going to do? It's demoralizing. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the Bible talks about flaming arrows. In Ephesians 6, not just any flaming arrows, it says the devil's flaming arrows. And this is important because it says that our weapon against these flaming arrows, what do you think it is? Water. Water? Yes, the water. What, what do you think? Well, you said shield, right? It was a shield. Do you, know, you remember what it was a shield of? What, what was it? Shield of faith. Wow, the shield of faith. Now we can throw it out here and ask somebody out in the audience, explain to me what faith is. Oh, no, no, one's, no one's brave right now. <laughs> what? When you have a strong belief in something. Okay, when you have a strong belief. You guys can all turn to Hebrews 11, verse 1. It's right there. It, it tells us exactly what faith is, okay? It tells us exactly what faith is. It's confidence in what we hope for and assurance of things we cannot see. So this, this shield we have, it's a shield of faith. It's a shield of focus on God, of trust in God. That's what it is. So the shield, it's funny, it says it's going to extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. And why do you think the devil's throwing flaming arrows? Remember, a flaming arrow wasn't necessarily supposed to be shot at somebody. What was that? It was distracting. Wow. Mikhail's on a roll here. It was distracting. So when the devil throws these flaming arrows at us, when he shoots them, they're to distract us. They're to hit things around us. They're to take our attention off the battle in front of us. They're to demoralize us. They're to take our confidence away. And this shield of faith, this shield of confidence, of trust in God, it keeps our focus on him so we're not worried about these things that are whizzing by us and zooming by us, right? This is why faith is so important. Because we see the devil does this trick all throughout the Bible. He tries to convince people that something that is true isn't. Or he tries to say, are you sure that's the truth? He tries to deceive, to distract and we need to be aware of that and know, no, nope, we're not going to get distracted. We're going to stay true to our assignment, and we're going to stay true to God. So I want you guys to remain focused. I want everybody to look forward right now. Turn around and look forward. Don't look up what Mr. Jimmy's doing. I'm just going to throw some flaming arrows at you, all right? So you guys just look forward. Don't look up. It's okay. I promise. Put on your shield of faith while I do this. What happens to a bag if you pop it and it's got water in it? Oh, we're about to find out. Hold on. No, 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 hold on. Hey, sit back. You're doing so good. All right, so the, the lesson here is don't be distracted by these arrows. They're just there to take your attention away. And if you have a lack of faith or a lack of trust in God, maybe to God that's the same as having no faith or no trust at all. You can't just trust God 90%. He demands 100%, right? The Bible tells us our God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of yes and no, either for him or against him. All right, so we're going to continue learning about Luke. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, yeah, we thank you so much that we can learn stuff from history, Lord, that, that relates back to your word and your truth. Now, these flaming arrows, Lord, they might not even be meant for us, but they're meant to be distractions to us. And we see the devil doing that all throughout the Bible, just trying to distract us, trying to pretend that he's something we're not, trying to convince us that we're something we aren't. Lord, but your Bible tells us that we are children of God, Lord. We are co-heirs through Christ in your kingdom, and we thank you 
so much for that. that. These flaming arrows, they might be going by us. Some of us might be having a whole volley of them going by us right now. Lord, just allow us to remain focused on you, to have that shield of faith, Lord, that confidence in things we hope for and that assurance of things we have not yet seen. Lord, because you are there, you are present. And we just pray that you make yourself known to us even more and that we're receptive to seeing you in the places you already are, but we're blind to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are um, two prayer cards that I would like to share. One is for continued healing for Pastor Steve Jameson, who is recovering from a stroke and surgery, and also David Woodland to have safe travels. So let's join together in a time of quietness and lift up to God the joys and concerns that are on our hearts. If we could be in an attitude of prayer, please. Loving God, we thank you for all of the prayers that we bring to you today, those that are lifted up, those that are spoken, those that are written, those that are on our hearts, and those that are too deep even for our words to speak. We thank you for all of the leaders in our community and all of the people who are helping one another. We thank you for our missionaries. We thank you for the community of churches, for those who are homebound in hospitals, in rehabs and assisted living, and for those who are serving in the military. And we ask your blessing on those who are continuing to work in front and behind the scenes as co-creators of your kingdom. We thank you especially for those who are here and the hard work that they do often unseen. And we thank you for their faithfulness. And we ask that you continue to guide and direct our hearts and lives to go deeper with you in faith and to walk as you would have us to be called. And as we join together with the confidence of the children of God in our Lord's Prayer, help us to remember that this prayer is said around the world and that we join together as one community and say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, the mother of my Lord? Why do you come to me? Or as soon as I heard, for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Elizabeth Stone wrote, Having a child is momentous. It is to, to decide forever that your heart will go walking around outside your body. That's an interesting way of looking at children. Your heart goes walking outside your body. So this is an account of Mary and Elizabeth. Sometimes we hear this during Advent, but I wanted to look at this before we get into the Advent season. 
And Elizabeth is an older woman who was not expected to ever have children, and she is blessed with pregnancy by God. And Mary, of course, the mother of Christ, is also blessed with the Holy Spirit and is pregnant. And so these two women come together with this conversation, two women who God has chosen to begin transforming the world an unmarried woman, and a woman past a childbearing age. Now, both of these situations dishonor and exclude these two from community. Both are considered unworthy. Reverend Dr. Casey Baggett tells a story about her ordination she said, a number of years ago when I was anticipating my ordination, I came across a place in the ordination service that made me pause. The service had one person saying she is worthy, and the entire congregation replied she is worthy indeed with an exclamation point. I went to the senior pastor who was helping with the plans for the service, and I explained with all humility that I didn't feel comfortable with that phrase. There were a lot of people more worthy than I, and frankly, I could name them. I would feel absolutely silly going before all of the congregation, having them exclaim, she is worthy, with an exclamation point, and that that part of the service really had to go. She said, I'll never forget his response. He said, well, we're keeping it in the service for two reasons. One, the bulletins are already printed. I love that answer. But secondly, and more importantly, we're keeping it in because you're missing the point. The affirmation isn't about you. It's about God. It's about the congregation saying that they believe in God so much and they believe that God is so loving and so powerful and so compassionate that God can transform any willing soul into being worthy, including you. <laughs> she said, I never forgot that. God is so loving, so powerful, and so compassionate that God can transform any willing soul into being worthy, including us. Now, Mary and Elizabeth were not people of importance or significance, and they actually held no delusions of grandeur, because Elizabeth says, who am I that you should come to me, Mary, with this stupendous discussion about being pregnant with the Lord? They expected that things would only happen to great people, and they thought if God was going to do something big, then God, of course, would pick someone with significance or importance. Pastor Nathan Nettleton says it well. He says, God does not seem to want to do this. Bethlehem is God's chosen place for the birth of the Savior, and Mary is God's chosen person. But who sees this? Elizabeth, who is completely insignificant and unimportant. And why does this matter? because we often make decisions based on something other than what it is. We want places to be more important than others, and we want some people to matter more than others. He says, how different our world would be if every place and every person was regarded as holy. How different our world would be if every place we went in a day, in a week, in a month, we decided was significant and worthy of respect and honor and care. How different our relationships would be if we decided that every person we come across bears the presence of God and has a word of God for us to hear how different our world would be. And yet we have to recognize as people who live in this time, in this space, that that is not what is happening. There is a video made by the North Carolina United Methodist Conference. 
male pastors were invited to read real comments that had been made to female pastors serving in churches. The men did not get to read the comments ahead of time. The Lutheran Synod did one of their own. I won't tell you what was said, because it was bad. The men were obviously uncomfortable reading these comments. And when I watched this video, I thought, this is really a good video, except for one problem. The comments aren't bad enough. Because every one of my clergy friends who happened to be women said, we've heard worse. One pastor summed it up nicely. He, they, they, the people who were videoing him said, how do you feel about this? And he just went, ugh. We're so unaware sometimes of the words that we use and say to one another and how we don't see the holy in each other. But I liked how one man responded when they asked, you know, what was this experience like for you? He said, clergy who are women have had many more obstacles to face and it deepens my appreciation for their willingness to press on when it would be easier to walk away. It's not just women who have this problem. Many people I know have more obstacles to face than others. And it deepens my appreciation for them, for their willingness to press on in faith when it would be easier just to walk away. God moves mountains and calls us to greater lives. God sees us as worthy. And that calls us to greater life. God calls us to see the holy in each other. And it's there if we look for it. God calls us to move mountains and live in greater lives in trust. When Mary speaks a greeting to Elizabeth, John the Baptist, who was the baby in Elizabeth's womb, responds. It fulfills scripture. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> prompted by the Spirit. It is Elizabeth who is filled with the Holy Spirit who knows that Mary is pregnant before they even have the conversation and further she knows that Mary's child will be the Lord. Mary is blessed and so is Elizabeth when the society around them says, Ugh, no. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to live that way. You're not supposed to be that way. But Mary and Elizabeth live to a greater life of trust and hope in God's power and in God's promise. What follows after this conversation is called the Magnificat. We don't really look at it too often in the church because I think we find poetry a bit difficult. But in the very next verse, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. It's curious phrasing, don't you think? Some modern translations actually kind of change it up a little bit. They go, my soul praises the Lord, or my heart rejoices in the Lord. I kind of like, my soul magnifies the Lord. Why? Magnification makes things bigger. I love that idea. My soul makes the Lord bigger. My soul shows a picture of Christ that is bigger than me. My soul has a capacity to make things bigger.
We magnify the Lord when we are merciful. We magnify the Lord when we are compassionate. We magnify the Lord when we care for one another. We magnify the Lord through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, our witness, and that is our stewardship. It is not just about finances, although Byron did a beautiful job talking about the church and all the ministries and the finances therein, but it is prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. All of those come together. We magnify the Lord through our gifts of money and ourselves. We magnify the Lord through our persistence when it would be easier to just give up. We magnify the Lord when no one will speak, and we speak. We magnify the Lord when people's voices are being drowned out, and we raise them up. One church decided that they were going to notice when people in the church magnified the Lord. I don't know whether they called them the magnification team. I kind of like that. I'm on the magnification team. Members of the church quietly went around and, and put their eyes and ears on and started to watch and listen to see where people were magnifying the Lord. <clears throat> they realized that people in their church were offering hospitality and welcome to people who were marginalized in their community. They realized that people in their congregation were offering a place of welcome to people with disabilities or who were from other countries. They realized that there were people in their congregation who traveled interstate to take care of sick folks, not necessarily in their own families, but friends. They watched and heard as people visited others in hospitals and shut-ins and started programs for children and families. We magnify the Lord through our lives. And this church decided to be very intentional about noticing when that happened. And then they shared those results with others. They didn't name names. They just, every week, this is where we have magnified the Lord. I think it's why we need Advent. Oftentimes we kind of skip over Advent. You know, we don't need prayer. We don't need preparation. We know Jesus was born. We know Jesus is with us. But we need that time to open our hearts to be led by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we need time to let God's word be inscribed on our hearts because we carry God's love and God's longing for all people wherever we go. But here's the thing. Once you decide you want to move a mountain and live a better life, you better uh, be prepared for what's coming because... God's not going to be put in a box. God will catapult us out of stuff that's comfortable and familiar. And we'll be meeting new people and having new experiences. And frankly, I think that's just fabulous. You know, sometimes moving mountains can be a little bit scary. But I'll tell you something, the most fun I've ever had is when God moves a mountain and puts me in the range of someone I've never known before. And I have some of the most awesome experiences meeting people that are very different. And sometimes odd. And sometimes strange. And sometimes, you know, they're thinking the same thing about me. Boy, you're really odd and strange. And yet, once we get past the odd and strange bit, we really begin to enjoy hearing stories and sharing Christ 
and being together. Mountains call us to live greater lives, trust and hope, and being willing to move forward and see not just what's here, but what's here. Look beyond the external, look at the internal, look for Christ, because all of us are worthy. Amen. I'll pray as I see people running. <laughs> Let me say a word of prayer. Loving God, we ask your blessing on us as we continue to open our hearts to you. Help us to live this week seeing you in one another, seeing each other as worthy, trusting you, and living in your certain hope that even if we don't see your work, we know it is there. Even if we don't see the change, we know the change is there. And we ask that you help us move mountains to live greater lives and to share with one another the magnification of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're there. All right, our closing song is Anchor. You may stand or sit as you... Drifting beneath the horizon Body is weak but I'm trying To make it to shore If I've been sinking So unto your promise I'm clinging You say that I'm strong To you I belong And keep holding on Cause you are my So steady me, steady me now And you are my anchor You're keeping my feet on the ground In angry oceans you've never broken Through every wave of the storm You are my anchor so steady me, steady me now Come steady me, steady me now And when I get tired of finding All of the fears I've been hiding You gave me a breath And tell me to rest You never left Cause you are my anchor So steady me, steady me now You are my anchor You're keeping my feet on the ground In angry oceans you've never broken Through every wave of the storm you are my anchor So steady me, steady me now Come steady me, steady me now Nice. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord here and in the world. Amen.